Well, I don't know if you can see from this, but it's been a bit of a week. The snow's coming down and it's been like this a lot of the time this week. Um, and yet there are still animals out here and they've still got to be fed. And that's why I'm out here in this now with this old tractor, putting a bale. I'm going to have to go up that bank there, stick it in that field there. There's a bit of hard standing up there to put it on so that these animals can be kept warm in their stomachs. And after a bit, a run of days like this, especially in February when the days are short and oh, it gets to be hard work. Farming gets to be hard work and you get to wonder why you're out here doing this in all weathers. So I'm cutting down a bit behind this bale now in the hope of keeping dry while I talk to you. But let me say, farmers, people out there in general, beware. February is a bad month for how you feel about things, for your view of the world, for your positive outlook. Uh, February is a time when the days are getting longer again and you'd think it'd be alright but November the days are getting shorter and you notice February they're getting longer and you notice and somehow it upsets your equilibrium and you begin to feel very negative about things and just spending all day working outside, feeding animals up, trying to keep everything happy gets on top of you. Now you've got to watch it, okay? It is important in these times to take certain precautionary measures. So we take measures with the tractor. We take measures with the tractor because we know they're not safe. We take measures to stop ourselves getting physically hurt. What farmers are really, really bad at with health and safety is looking after not just their physical health and safety, but their psychological health and safety, how they feel. And psychological first aid in farming is very, very hard to get. You can go and get your first aid at work certificate, that's fine. But psychological, looking after yourself, phew, boy, that doesn't come very high on the list. It's got to come higher, guys. Let's talk about it. A wise old farmer who'd been round the uh, course a few times said to me a long time ago, every day get off the farm and get down the village. Every week get out of the farm and get down the town. Every month get out of the farm, go through the village, through the town and get away for a bit. Spend a day away. And that's one of the ways we can deal with the stresses and the pressures that come on us by getting away from things and having a break. It makes sense but it's working from the outside in to relieve the pressures on you. It's definitely something about coming out to Mart as well. You're coming amongst people who share an interest, share the same sort of problems, and you can all have a moan together about the weather or the state of the single farm payment, whatever it is, whatever's on your mind, and it's people there to understand. Or maybe you get amongst the feed reps you know, and of course they understand the business as well, and maybe they're family friends and they've been around for ages, so that helps as well. Another good tip is to give yourself a little treat before you set out in the day or at some point during the day. And before I start the day, I'm just off to Mart now to get on with my work. I, uh, if I'm feeling low, I, I give myself a little treat. I, um, I, I like a nice coffee. So I put a coffee in here and then I can peck away at it all during the day. And it, it, sort, of, it sort of brightens up your day to have a nice cup of freshly ground coffee during the day. Now, all those things are really good ideas and it makes common sense to, to be thinking of things like that when, when you are in the middle of February and things are a bit grim and the days are dark and wet and horrible. Um, people say, um, do those things, that's fine, it goes so far. Um, but uh, the issue is this, it's still strengthening people from the outside in. And we all know a good set of stomach muscles is a lot better than a corset in uh, holding things together for you, right? Which is why, if you come to our stand in Kamal the Mark, you'll see we've got a lot of things on this stand, books and things of that sort, that are to do with strengthening people from the inside out. So, when it comes to dealing with stress and finding stillness and peace, where do we go? We go back, in my view, we go back to the ancient wisdom of people who have found the answer to these issues themselves over time and personally very often I go back to the people who wrote the Psalms in this case we might go back to Psalm 62 and there's David talking firstly in the first few verses this is 1 to 4 of Psalm 62 about seeking stillness under stress truly he says my soul finds rest in God my salvation comes from him you know, the idea that people will give you of finding peace within yourself, it's not helpful. I've spent 30 odd years in pastoral ministry and the trouble that we have so often is that we cannot find peace within ourselves because there isn't peace within ourselves. And, and David says, well, you know, there is peace, but it's, 
it's not within. If, if, if peace was found within, he wouldn't be in a place uh, where he is. He wouldn't have a problem if peace was within him. What's going on? It's not an issue, is it? But much of the time, we haven't got that peace within ourselves that we need. And we need to go outside of ourselves to find it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul, much, much later than David the psalmist, says he himself is our peace. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Christ is our peace. We've got to go outside ourselves, find it somewhere else. And Paul is saying, in my experience, and he, he did have a fairly challenging and troubled life from time to time, did the Apostle Paul. He says, Christ is our peace. We go to him. We find our peace there with him. Not church, mind. Not church. Christ himself. So we need to go outside ourselves, and these guys are telling us, you go to God. Why? Psalm 62, verse 1, my salvation comes from him. And as if reassurance is needed, he needs to reconvince himself. The psalmist repeats it. Truly, he is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. We try and tell ourselves, don't we? You know, farmers are good at this. We try and tell ourselves, well, you know, I'll be fine. It'll be fine. Bash on. You know, I'm a tough cookie. Hmm. Yeah. You may be. Relatively tough as humans go. I'm sure. But no one, have you ever thought of this? No one is as tough a cookie as God. He is my fortress, says the psalmist. And then, yeah, then... I shall not be shaken. And if he is your fortress, your fortified place of refuge under threat and attack, well, that being the case, verse 2, I shall never be shaken. We had an earthquake recently near Swansea, and uh, people's houses and offices and, 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 and shops shook with this noise, this grinding, this noise, and the shaking, vibration, the movement people's places shook. But you know something? Oystermouth Castle didn't move. <laughs> of course it didn't move. It's a big, strong fortress. It's never going to be shaken by a thing like that. So given that God is a very tough cookie, and God is my unshakable fortress, given that, then what? Verses 3 and 4. There are those who want to charge at me, says the psalmist. Behaving badly, telling lies, misrepresenting the truth, being threatening and violent, whatever it happens to be. They want to knock me. I, who put my trust in God, they want to knock me down, pointless. Because the castle of my heart, my soul, my life is secure. Because there is no tougher cookie than God. He is my fortress. So I will not be shaken. And David, that's his experience. And then in verses 5 following on that Psalm 62, he, he shares that. He says, yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Now then, here comes another truly. The third truly that he says in this psalm. He's emphasizing truth over against the lies and the error that they're coming against him with. He goes to high truth. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. And then out of that experience, his own experience in troubling and stressful times, the psalmist seeks to pass on his experience, the benefit of it, what he's learned. Verse 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Put your... Pour out your hearts to him. Put your trust in him. And he says... Pour out your hearts to him. That's what you'll do if you trust him. Pour out your heart to him. For God is our refuge. The low born, he says, are but a breath. The high born are but a lie. Riches can be increased by fair means and foul. Don't set your heart on them because that isn't security, says the psalmist. And he's had some of that himself. Not secure there, he says. Riches and wealth and whatever. Power belongs to you, O God. That's where power resides. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. 
the pretended power you see of mankind, of our own resources, is pretended. That's the trouble with it. But power actually resides in God. And if he's your strong fortress, no problem. Your power, his power, is your fortress. And then the psalmist concludes, with you, Lord, is unfailing love. Human power is pretended. His is innate, inherent. It's his. With you, Lord, with that God who has all that power, there's unfailing love. It is consistent. He loves us consistently with the power that he has behind him to do so and to protect and care and be the fortress for those who put their trust in him. Truly my heart waits quietly for God, he said in verse 1. And here's why. Because God is strong and God is loving and God is reliable. So I go to him and find my peace in him. Mm -hmm. 